Hello and welcome to another Morales Minute. These are quick tips and sage advice to level up your Web3 game development. Hi, my name's Sam. I'm a Unity certified developer at Morales. I have over 20 years of game dev experience and more than 10 years experience as a digital nomad. I love spending time in nature and practicing sports, as well as drawing, painting, and making music. Together, we'll learn more about Web3 Gaming. Web3 Gaming technology, including decentralization, immutability, and transparency, enables new player experiences. Learn lessons from popular Web3 gameplay design to inspire your game development. Learn more about the Morales Web3 Unity SDK by clicking the link above. And click here to learn about the benefits of Web3 in gaming. And learn more about designing for Web3 in gaming by watching this video. Getting started. Now, as you start playing more Web3 games, one of the unique aspects of playing them is Web3 wallets. These wallets are an important piece to help you authenticate, to sign important transactions during gameplay, as well as holding your NFTs and currency that may go along with the game. One of the standards that you see out there is Wallet Connect. Many of the different branded Web3 wallets use Wallet Connect technology. This is just an easy open standard for developers to develop for and for these Web3 wallets to connect with. And you can see on the right MetaMask, which was one of the popular examples. The process of getting started in a particular game using the wallet depends, but most of them follow a flow, something like setting up the wallet, then maybe funding the wallet if the game needs currency to get started. Then you'd start the game, authenticate using the wallet, and then periodically throughout the life of that game, you'll need to sign certain key transactions, things that are on-chain and immutable. Getting started with Sandbox. To get started with this game, let's take a look at the website at sandbox.game. While this is primarily a downloadable game played on your Windows or Mac PC, there's quite a bit you can do online as well through the browser. The first thing I did when getting started was to create my 3D avatar. There's tons of options here, and I randomized a bit and then chose some different outfits and body types that match my preferences. From the browser, you can also take a look at the marketplace. These are all the in-game assets that are stored as NFTs. Some of them are cosmetic, some of them are collectible, as well as those that unlock lands and gameplay and give you more to do within the game itself. The Sandbox ecosystem strongly embraces the creator concept. Here, user and player generated content can be included in the game, given away for free, or sold between players. To facilitate that, the Create tab here on the website shows several different downloadable projects. There's the Avatar Editor, which I showed already. There's also a voxel format 3D modeling and animation tool, which allows anybody to create in-game assets characters, NPCs, and whole worlds. There's also a game maker, which is incredibly powerful. I watched some videos about it. I didn't play with it, but it looks like you're able to add games and gameplay within your own land if you're an owner of part of the sandbox game 3D virtual world. Speaking of the virtual world, a core part of the sandbox experience is being able to buy, own, and then operate activities within land. This map shows a small snippet of what land is out there and possible. You can see some famous brands have already bought up some virtual spaces. The owner of the land can choose who can enter, what you can do there, what types of NFTs and assets exist. So you have more control as a land owner. To get started with my first play session, I downloaded the client, I chose Windows. And before we jump in and talk about that first game session, let's take a look at the tokens that are used throughout the game. For more information about that, let's hear from Tom. Hey everyone, I'm Tom Iannone, Head of Sales and Customer Success at Morales. 
What I like the most about the sandbox is it's very straightforward in terms of its game mechanics and overall the currency and items being used in the game. The only in-game currency that's being used is sand token, so this is the currency that's used in-game as well as the governance token. Next we have land, so these are NFTs that give you ownership to different plots of land across the sandbox map. You can then build player experiences on that land so they can visit and play the game that you built. Next we have assets, so these are also NFTs that are either user generated by other players and sold in the marketplace or initially created by Sandbox when they launch the game. Uh, depending on sponsorships and other partnerships they have, they typically have different themes for different seasons or, or different promotions that are being done. All of these can then be combined into a final player experience or a game which other players can view when they're exploring the map. Now that we have an overview of the gameplay and the tokenomics, let's take a look at the official Sandbox game trailer. Now that the game client has been downloaded, I'll talk about the gameplay and my first time user experience. So when the game client first loads up, I'm shown a screen like this with some very basic instructions about how to move around and interact with the world. At that point, you're pretty much off and running, playing the game, and it's a tutorial as you play the first few quests. Now, one of my first quests was to find these plunger items that are branded with the Rabbids brand. With that quest and with some of the other ones, in my first hour or so of gameplay, I talked to different NPCs. I would talk to one who would tell me to go to another, and you're going solving some kind of conversational door and key puzzles, as well as collecting items around the world. In the slice of gameplay that I had, I wasn't challenged from a gameplay standpoint. There wasn't any arcade style reflex based gameplay. It was wandering around the world and following through with these quests. I'm not sure what other gameplay elements exist deeper into the experience, but I found most of it was scratching the exploration itch. Each player can have multiple active quests. You can see on the right side of this screenshot, I have several different quests and each one of them shows up in game as you see in the center of the screen there with a 3D marker that helps you navigate through the world. So where to go next is always very apparent, especially if you have a couple quests, you'll be choosing between which one to do. I imagine you could solve all the quests, but probably the next conversation or two you have with NPCs, it seemed like they were always offering me the ability to run an errand or fulfill a quest. And immediately with my first quest given, I was interacting with other third-party brands. So I'm not sure what the revenue model behind these is, but I would imagine that because so many of them were about browsing through NFTs, I wasn't required to purchase any, but you're very much invited to interact with these NFTs and see them in the marketplace. So perhaps each of these brand is owning and operating a good portion of those NFTs and perhaps recouping finances from the sales of those NFTs. There was a whole board ape gallery that one of my first quests was to enter what looked like an art museum. And to complete the quest, I had to step up and look at each one of the NFTs. And some of my first quests involved going to other parcels of land. So while you're using the keys and walking your character through 
the 3D environment, much like a traditional video game for most of what I had. There were quests which would teleport me showing a loading screen, and then I would be poof up into a different part of the overall 3D geometry of the world. In this Ledger School of Block, I was educated about Web3 and crypto, real information, and then given a quiz back on how Web3 operates and what are some general security concerns. So the educational use case for Sandbox to me is quite clear. It felt like a friendly and intuitive environment for me to step through. And the dialogue trees that you have with people is a natural fit for them telling you information and then also quizzing you and giving you multiple choice questions. I found some familiar characters from Walking Dead into the main hub. And one of those quests took me to a Walking Dead world. So within any world, you can scan the NFTs. So rather than walking up to them and interacting with them individually, which you can do, you can also click a UI button and that will scan the environment or the nearby amount of NFTs and just list them out like a marketplace. Then clicking any one of those shows the full marketplace details for that item. And some of them like this one here, you can purchase. Now, during my play session, I didn't purchase any NFTs. I'm not exactly sure what the value would be for the gameplay. I'd imagine some NFTs would un immediately unlock access to content, as well as other ones would have their value be to hold them long term, hope that their perceived value goes up, and then you could resell them back into the market. Another quest I found brought me to Lululand. I started out in a train station and was given some quest to do, but when I noticed on the wall there was a QR code, I just got out my phone and connected it. And then on my phone, it unlocked a puzzle to play along with the gameplay. So this got me very interested in what types of experience you could have across multiple devices. Here I was wandering through the world as I had been before, but I had my phone out and I was kind of interacting between those two screens to solve the quest. Now that I've had my first time user experience, let's step back and talk about Sandbox's design. So traditionally, you address the needs of particular players and player types. You'll know that people coming to your game may be interested in different aspects of the gameplay. You want to consider each of them. Now, with Web3, the opportunities are so rich for someone coming to your experience, they may not even fit the traditional player type who's there mostly for the fun of it. You also have earners who are there to play, perhaps for the financial benefits of it, more than the gameplay itself. And then you have the investor type who may never even open up the game at all. They would either invest through the NFT space, the currency space, or they could even fund earners and players who are in there doing the day-to-day -day experience of the gameplay itself. Now, a traditional game steps through a loop of gameplay, action, reward, and expansion. Let's think about the classic game Pac-Man. As Pac-Man moves through the maze, the actions here are to turn the character through the maze. The rewards are the pellets that the character collects, and for expansion, there's power pellets, special pickups that he can get, that will change his abilities, temporarily giving him invulnerability, where he can chase the enemies. Now with Web3, we have a critical change here. Each time your character is rewarded, you're able to interact with the blockchain. Now this depends dramatically on the game itself, but some things you might be able to do after getting a reward of currency or NFTs or other assets, you could buy and sell those on the open market. You could perhaps stake them for increased income. And then there's governance opportunities as well. Here are the high-level details of this game. Let's ask Tom to help us out with some more details here. Hey everyone, it's Tom again. As we've discussed, the Sandbox is a sandbox MMO type of game that allows players to create and explore experiences across the Sandbox map. In terms of game mechanics, you're going to start with authenticating or logging into your account. The action that's taken is typically creating or exploring experiences. The reward will often be generating sand token, depending on the type of experience or game you're playing. That sand token can then be used in the marketplace to purchase in-game assets or additional land to expand and create more experiences. The tokens that are being used in game is it's actually just sand token. And this is functioning as both the utility and governance token. In this case, that's perfectly fine to do because sand is not actually being burned for minting and in-game activities. It's only exchanging hands between players. So there's really no need to separate between utility and governance tokens as you might see with other games. 
So overall, in order to generate sand, you can create your own assets and sell them in the marketplace. You can build your own experience. You can trade different items. And you can also play the alpha seasons that uh, probably happen, I would say, every few months. And typically those will have a number of airdrops and rewards associated with them. While wrapping up my review of Sandbox, I came across the official Sandbox roadmap. Now, while Sandbox has been out for some years now, the version number and the branding still shows alpha around quite a bit of the experience. So I was interested to see what happens here in 2022 and beyond. It looks like this year we see several different maturations of some of their downloadable creator tools, as well as the overall world itself. And in the coming year or years, there's different goal targets for having more sponsors involved, more activities, and of course the user base growing, and even more additions to those creator tools. Now, I didn't dig into the creator tools themselves, but I would love to do that. And I'm particularly curious if they have applications outside of the sandbox world, or if these tools are used just for creating assets for the specific world here. I'm curious how open that is. But overall, my experience with the game and my first time playing the game, as well as what promise I see in the game itself, as well as the roadmap, it has me really excited for Sandbox as a game, and I'd like to play more. Now that we're inspired by that game, let's look at how Morales Web3 Unity SDK could help us in development. If we look at the generations of the web, we're departing Web2 and enjoying more and more Web3 experiences. Now, it's not a perfect analogy, but let's look at the generations in games. With middleware technology like Morales and Unity Game Engine, we're able to create Web3 experiences with features for our players that have never been possible before. Morales provides a single workflow for building high-performance dApps. It's compatible with all your favorite Web3 tools and services. Now, Unity is one of the most popular game engines out there, and the Morales Web3 Unity SDK brings the power of Morales into your Unity projects. So what does every dApp and Web3 game need? Well, it needs to authenticate users, send and fetch assets, interact with contracts, and observe real-time events from those contracts. Morales does all this and more. To authenticate users with Morales, you use the Authentication Kit prefab. Drag that into your scene and your authentication is handled. To send assets with Morales, we can use Execute Contract function for example, to mint an NFT. And to fetch assets from the blockchain, Morales offers many options, including get NFTs and get NFT owners. To interact with contracts, Morales offers run contract function for read operations and execute contract function for read and write operations. And to watch for real-time events, Morales is fully compatible with your favorite Web3 tools and services. You can connect Morales to your favorite backend and receive live events in real time, the ones that your game needs. Now that we've been inspired by that game design and seen how Morales empowers game development, what will you build next? Level up your Web3 development skills by building weekend projects. Sign up at morales.io slash projects. Visit docs.morales.io to download and get started. Thanks.